there's a wonderful tree here that uh, I mean part of the uh, the countryside on one of these little micro walks before we start the episode each day now which uh, which has been um, I assume this bit's been purposefully burned and there's a tree in the middle of it which is all just sort of black and withering let me just pop you in my pocket as I say and get a picture photography daily reasonably dull day actually I'm gonna go down to 200 ISO and I'm gonna shoot at f4 no f5 6 1 2 5th here we go one more yeah I love the shape of that let's take you out the pocket again I'm gonna call that my uh, something and nothing tree or is it actually that links to this quite well. There's a photographer called Tyler Casson. Neil, you almost planned this. It's a bit contrived. Well, all right, maybe, but uh, that is a fabulous tree. Tyler Casson. I saw him on a, a nine-year-old uh, petapixel post when I was poking around the internet earlier on. And um, I'll include the link. He's been photographing one solitary tree uh, in the same county, funnily enough, just up Road. Um, for five years in each of the, the seasons, over and over and over and over. It was a 2012 uh, post, ashes, but uh, yeah, same tree, same angle, different seasons. Long-term project, which must be now, that's a f- um, maths, <laughs> 14 years. Uh, same tree, same place, same angle, different seasons, 14 years now, if, if he carried on doing it, that is. But uh, that's a, a sort of a, a, a something and nothing study, but also an everything picture, isn't it? A very patient study. And patience is the, uh, I think that's the, uh, the key word today. Can you imagine working on a single project for 35 years? 35 years. That's how long Marissa Roth, my guest, has spent working on one, one person crying, women and war. Um, started in 1984, this project. If you think about the history of the 80s, and I did have to look this up, I was thinking, well, what happened in 1984? And I found a, a couple of things. It was the year that Ronald Reagan started his second term. Um, it was also the year, actually, where the world first started to hear about a pandemic called AIDS. And then, of course, the Russians, they got all very heated, didn't they? And uh, pulled out the, uh, the LA, or said they were gonna, not going to come to the LA for the Olympics. Then, of course, uh, not long after, they all got chummy, didn't they? It's a time of, um, in my life, when I was, uh, I was getting interested in what I could do with my newly found driving licence. That was what I was doing. And uh, I think I took care, well, I don't think, I know, because I told the whole story on, the, uh, on one of the more episodes recently. I took my mum's um, brown Honda Civic for um, a bit of a jump over a humped back bridge to see if, uh, to see if it could fly. But uh, to do a photo project for 35 years, what an incredible feat. And uh, one very hard, really, to discuss in just one interview. But I think we manage. So uh, that's who we've got today. We've got Marissa Roth. And I wanted to tell you about a a brand new book. And I meant meant actually to to tell you something about this the other day during the photo walk. And then uh, I got to the end of the photo walk, probably looking out for the adders that I was talking about and uh, entirely forgot to to tell you then, so I'm going to tell you now. It's called The uh, Photographer's Playbook, and it was introduced during one of our wonderful Zoom meetups at the start of the month. 307 assignments and ideas. It's by uh, Fulford and Halpern Press. Fabulous book. Some of our previous guests are actually in there. Ed Ed Cashy, I spied in there, who talks about uh, circling your subject and engaging. Very strong piece. But um, I noticed in there, and since I mentioned something and nothing... We don't just throw this together, you know. I'm going to come back to that. There's something and nothing with a tree picture. And these, uh, these sh- short photo walks I, I do before the show. And of course, on the, 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 the longer Friday photo walk one, I, I often talk about the somethings and nothings, those photographs that you make that uh, you just, uh, you're, you're almost scrapbooking, aren't you? Those uh, something and nothings. And uh, in the book, Alessandro Sanguinetti, ah, oh, there's a name for you. Uh, he talked about this. He said, the best assignment I was ever given was when I was 15 and in my first photography class. We were told to make a whole tri-x roll of one thing, a park bench. And this was the reason, by the way, I was photographing benches on Friday. It was all supposed to link in then. 
on the face of it, he says, probably the most boring assignment in the history of assignments, but I remember being very excited. I felt like I had to do magic. I had to make something out of a nothing. And, he says, I'm still working on it. Isn't that the best thing about photography? Still working on it. Are you ready to start? Let's talk to Marissa. Marissa Roth. Photography Daily. Today, a Pulitzer Prize winner whose inspiration for storytelling pictorially started like many at an early age. Coming of age in America during the 60s and 70s, I was very aware of the photojournalism coming out of the Vietnam War. In some way, I became a peace activist when I was 12 years old. We talk about the inspiring gift of adventure brought by picture making. I love to move and I I do love the world and I love people and I loved seeing things so yeah in that regard I would say yes being a photographer was a passport to the world. We discuss Marissa's early years behind the lens collating the daily news in one of the most vibrant cities in the world. Psychologically we had to be like a television set you know like the old-fashioned televisions you had a dial <laughs> you know, and it's just like you dialed in whatever you needed to be. But then life changed quite dramatically for a city photojournalist who had no idea she was about to be introduced to an international 35-year photography project. She said, oh, there's a story that nobody cares about. And she said, you know, it's after the 10-year war with the Soviet Union and there's 100,000 Afghan war widows as a result. It was a project that was to be all-consuming. I know this will sound strange, but I was so almost possessed by it. And sometimes I almost felt like I had a, a hand on my right shoulder, just like steering me along the path. One person crying, women and war. 35 years photographing and interviewing women and cultures affected by war and studying the objects, the pieces left behind. I had heard about these letters and I had never seen one. And the shock of it, I mean, I still find it shocking when I read it, you know, because you think, wow, are they really that devoted or are they brainwashed? 35 years is a long time not knowing how the story should end. And then in 2019, I just thought, you know, I have to put a period at the end of the sentence because otherwise it's going to kill me. You know, psychologically, emotionally, financially, I just need an end point. And I'm one of those photographers that finishes projects. We talk about how this and other projects have left Marissa with unbelievable anxiety attacks and to the point where I was almost incapacitated. I haven't actually never told anybody this. Mixed with this powerful emotive photo project, we also talk about a love story. And so they fell in love on the ship. They got lost from each other at Ellis Island and they literally by chance bumped into each other in Times Square five months later. Stories of life told by photographers. And today that photographer is Marissa Roth. The person, the place, the light, the story, um, it's, it's electrifying. Our thanks to MPB.com for being our sponsor. And on that note, here's a message from April Eaton Brown, spied in the Facebook group. MPB, she says, shakes my head in brackets. Neil James, what have you done? Last year on your advice, I started to pick up my latest kit, adding to my Canon kit... I purchased a used Sony AR7 IV, a big change for me as I've been a Canon shooter since 82. Well, of course, I needed some lenses, so I've purchased a 135, 200 to 600, 55, 12 to 24, 85 and 35. Do I need more? Thank you for your advice. I've spent a lot of money, but I've also saved a lot of money with MPB. Every item has been fantastic and I have zero complaints. These are all April's words, not mine. I started, she says, a project in March called Hashtag Life Before 8am, inspired by the Leaving and Waving episode. I'm enjoying the 12mm to capture these snaps, three cats and a dog that I love daily. No idea what I'll do with these, but uh, I love waking up with my cameras. I've enjoyed following others on the page. My Insta is at Sutton MA is my home. April is also one of our wonderful patrons. So I think with your uh, latest purchases, uh, least we can do is award you patron of the day and share, as we do whenever we do this. Share your Insta and slash or website with all those listening today. You'll find the link for April's work on the show page, which you will find on your podcast player app. Just look for the capitalised show notes. Patrons on all levels get to enjoy the two extra photo essays a week, which we call more. Uh, Yesterday we talked crime and the pictures of Ouija in a story called the photographer who knew murder. 
And it appears that you quite like Photography Daily taking on a kind of true crime podcast feel for a moment, just for one day. So we'll we'll definitely do that again. Tomorrow on the Patreon More channel, uh, that book of inspiration I mentioned at the head of the show, The Photographer's Playbook. I'm going to have a deeper dive into that and perhaps challenge a few of our members. Talking of inspiration, today, spoiler alert, you're going to hear one of the most inspirational throwaways. Marissa shares so much within the 40 minutes to come, but it was when she talked about her camera and a particular body at that being her, here's the throwaway, sketch pad. I just thought, yes, what an incredible way to think about my camera. It's a very um, utilitarian thing to me, usually. Well, my work ones are. They they need to be able to photograph in low light. They need to be pretty resilient to knocks and bangs. This is in no particular order, by the way. I have to know that they'll work in all temperatures, that they can start up quickly. These days have impressive focusing ability, good battery performance, and all those other things that you hear about in YouTube reviews of place your favourite brand and model of camera here. But then I picked up another camera recently, and as you know by the photo walks, it's one of my older digital beasts that had been sitting in a cabinet untouched for years. It's the X-Pro1 from Fujifilm. AF, to be fair, is pretty slow and ropey. You'll hear photographers constantly bleat about the lens chatter. There's irony. And the, the Q button drives me bonkers. Look, there's a, a bundle of other things that would not have me reach for it as my first choice if a fee is attached. Not now, anyway. But it is the first camera, the first camera above the X100s that I've had and above the two Leicas that I had, too, that goes everywhere with me. It has, I think, become my sketchpad. Though prior to talking with Marissa about it, I doubt her I'd have thought of it with quite that description. So today I'd like you to meet Marissa Roth, photojournalist, storyteller, documentarian. Marissa, I've, I've heard the word entree used of late by a handful of photojournalists and photographers when it comes to describing their, their relationship with photography, in that it provides you with this way to see life like, you know, a lot of people will never have that, that opportunity. Is that what attracted you to it? Um, no, I wouldn't say that was probably my key driving um, motivation. Um, I think for me... Becoming a photojournalist was a means of telling stories that I felt were important to tell. Coming of age in America during the 60s and 70s, I was very aware of the photojournalism coming out of the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. And my parents um, had magazines coming into the house, Life Magazine, Look Magazine, National Geographic, we got the LA Times every day, you know, we watched the evening news. So I was really, really aware of imagery. And my parents were European. And so I also was learning art history. So my visual education was substantial as well during those those early years. Um, ma magazines were very much the way we learned about what was going on in the world. I know there was television, but but it, were, it was the work of things like Life and National Geo, which which you, which would have been incredibly inspirational to anybody who wanted to be a storyteller. Yeah, plus they were, you know, the photo essays. So yeah, it was yeah. multiple imagery to tell a story. Um, so I think that I think that was forming me without me really understanding yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but then I also think in some way I became a peace activist when I was 12 years old. Um, I was fully aware of the Vietnam War. I was fully aware of the peace movement, of the civil rights movement, the women's movement. I was always into rock and roll. My poor mother, I, I think <laughs> I drove her insane with Bob Dylan and Kraftwerk and, you know, <laughs> then Bruce Springsteen on full volume. And, uh, but I, I think I was really, something was churning and it was the activism, it was the, uh, you know, the literature I was reading in high school, I had some really pro progressive English teachers in high school. So we were reading Kurt Vonnegut and Herman Hess. And, um, and it was just a time of everything was sort of percolating and exploding. And I had friends who had older siblings. So I, I had a lot of different influences. Mm. But photography, I mean, I, 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 
I loved photography from an early age. I, I started taking pictures with my, my mom's Instamatic Kodak when I was like 11. So, <laughs> Like always, when I know I'm going to be speaking to somebody, I, I go have a good look around and dig and see what, what articles they may have appeared in or films that they, they've appeared in. There were a couple of things that I heard you say in films that I wanted to to highlight with you. You said in one interview that you thought your temperament is suited to being a photographer. What what do you mean by that? Um, Well, I definitely have an independent spirit, but also I want to affect change and I want to make a difference. So my temperament also is, I guess I'm a bit of a risk taker. I don't have a death wish, uh, but I do am willing to push my own sort of emotional and psychological boundaries, if you will, and occasionally physical boundaries when I was younger, but mercifully I didn't tip over the edge. But I think my temperament, I, I, I really am, um, um, I have, when I was younger particularly, I'm still strong, but I was strong and I had a ton of energy all the time. And I just, I love to move and I, I do love the world and I love people and I love seeing things. So yeah, in that regard, I would say, yes, being a photographer was a passport to the world, but it was not, you know, it was not premeditated. That was sort of the, the side, the sidebar to it. Um, but what, what made you become a, a photojournalist instead of a, say, journalist? Yeah, but, I mean, I was... I I had a great sort of dilemma when I graduated from UCLA um, because I had been a staff photographer on the UCLA Daily Bruin, which was the the, the college paper. I loved to write, but I was also a fine art major in graphic design. So I had sort of these three directions and I had a great professor, Mitz Kataoka, and I went to him when I graduated and I said, what do I do? And he said, well, you cannot sit on three chairs at one time. He said, my suggestion is that you take one road, go down it, see how it's working for you. If it's working, keep at it. If it's not, stop, take the next road. So I took his advice. I got a job in a small design production house, um, discovered that I hated being cooped up in an office, um, lasted eight months, was barely making enough money to move out of the house, and put my photo portfolio together and started knocking on doors. And it took me about two years to get work. Wow. And again, I think I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a wanderer. You know, I, I think I have a nomad soul, which is also, you know, it's wonderful, but it's a problem because I'm still trying to figure out where I belong in the world. Well, that, that nomadic <laughs> soul has brought you to, to England for the moment, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I think in terms of my temperament, um, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I love being out there. I love working. I love interacting with people, even when it's been really hard emotionally and psychologically, like with the Women and War Project. But yeah, I love those moments of, you know, photographic magic when it all comes together, you know, sort of the person, the place, the light, the story. Um, it's, it's electrifying. While you talk about um, the photograph, I've heard you also describe a great photograph as something you feel. Is that something that's tangible to you at the time, or is that something you're expecting your your viewer to feel? Um, it's me. It's what I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, I don't expect the viewers I, I and anything. I hope people will have a reaction to my images. I don't want to manipulate a response. So I'm delighted if people do have a response to the images. But again, it's it's what I'm feeling. You know, I think the great photo is an amalgamation of what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking. And in those wonderful moments, those rare moments, it comes together. Well, those formative years in L.A. were pretty busy, I'd say. You, um, I mean, you saw LA from all directions, didn't you? I mean, I, I look looking through your portfolio, you see a very young DiCaprio and a very young Angelina Jolie. <laughs> but then, of course, right next to the the coverage of the LA riots, um, which, being part of the LA Times staff, brought you a Pulitzer Prize with the with the team. What do you? I mean, to ask you what you remember from those times seems a bit unfair. But there there must be moments where you think back with an awful lot of affection for the those times even though some of those stories were hard to cover like like the riots it was an amazingly insane time <laughs> um yeah. and you got to remember because you're in LA you're in your car all the time on the freeways so you know it was like 
70 mile or, you know, 65 miles an hour all the time going from here to there. So everything was like speedy. We were speedy as newspaper photographers because you have to go get your story, run back to the paper. Yeah. Now, you know, you can do it all streaming it digitally. But in those days, it was either film, black and white film or color film when I was working. Um, it was fun. I mean, it was crazy, but it was fun. But it was also a bit schizophrenic. I mean, I could be in South Central LA photographing somebody who was shot dead in a gang shooting, you know, with police and a white sheet. And then an hour later, I could be at the Beverly Hills Hotel, you know, photographing a Hollywood gala, yeah. um, you know, and it was, I almost felt like psychologically we had to be like a television set, you know, like the old fashioned televisions, you had a dial, <laughs> you know, and it's just like you dialed in whatever you needed to be. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of assignments that I have no recall. I mean, they're just a blur. Um, I mean, I probably, I tried to calculate when I was still shooting film, how many rolls of film I probably shot a year. And I probably, it's probably between like maybe ten to fifteen thousand rolls of film Good a year. Wow. Yeah, I mean it was it was it was fun. And I mean, when I started at the LA Times, we were still shooting black and white film. Mm. So you'd have to run out, do your assignment, come back to the paper, jump jump into the processing room, soup your film, throw it in the dryer. You know, go into the dark room, make your prints, run them out to whatever desk. And then you know, if you worked late enough at night, you could actually feel the vibration of the presses rolling. <laughs> And I mean, I love, you know, it was, it was great. I mean, it was really fun. Were you, were you honing an interest in any particular type of coverage at that time? Were you thinking, well, this is, you know, this is all, all very exhilarating, very exciting. Um, and as you say, very schizophrenic at times as well. But I want to go that direction or that. W w was that what was going on during those years? Not consciously with a specific direction, but I would say part of me was restless to do more international work, mm. do bigger stories. And um, after a while, you know, when you start doing the same story for the 10th time, I had, I guess I had bigger ambitions or just a bigger need that I didn't really know how to put into action. And then I was invited to go on a medical mission to the Philippines with a, with a, a medical relief agency because I was still freelance. Yeah. So I could do work for outside as long as it wasn't a computing newspaper and i pitched the story to the la times and they said yes we want to cover it and our manila bureau chief will cover it and so i went on this medical mission and uh, ended up working with the the bureau chief and we ended, we ended up falling madly in love with each other um so <laughs> i am um, I ended up going back and forth a few times to be with him. And then, of course, I was young and wild hearted and I just moved, you know, moved to the Philippines to be with him and kept working as a photographer and photojournalist, but also started doing my own work, just literally walking around Manila. Um, also, then I was going with him occasionally to other stories in other countries like Pakistan. They would send me, the paper would send me to Japan to work with one of their other correspondents. Um, and it was really a story in Pakistan, sort of a story after I did the story in Pakistan that really broke open the whole women and war project. Um, I was in Islamabad and I was chit-chatting with the, the AP bureau chief and just, you know, talking about stories. I wanted to do another story. And she said, oh, there's a story that nobody cares about. And she said, uh, you know, it's after the 10-year war with the Soviet Union, and there's 100,000 Afghan war widows as a result. Mm -hmm. And so somehow, I don't remember how, I was pretty, you know, fluid and wild in those days. I ended up getting to the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan and going into these camps and taking photographs um, and then sent them back to the paper. They redispatched my reporter and it ended up as a front page story on the LA times. Um, so it really broke the story. And that was for me, the pivotal moment for my women in war project, although I didn't know it at the time. Well, let's talk about one person crying women in war. 35 years. You didn't know it was going to be a multi-decade project when you started, but um, when, when did you, when did you feel, Oh, this looks like this could be, a mammoth long tail project. So after 
I was in the Philippines. I had to come back to LA because my mom was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. So I came back to take care of her. And then the relationship ended up coming apart. And I had too many responsibilities in LA anyway that I had to deal with after her life and all that. Um, and so I literally just slipped back, slipped back into my work life um, at the LA Times. It was literally, it was bizarre, like went from one day to the next. And then I was invited again to go with this, a different aid agency to Albania during the bombing of Kosovo. Mm. And it completely like brought me back to that same place, sort of emotionally and psychologically, which was really to tell the story of the women's side of war. And it was after that trip that I thought, okay, this is a subject and a theme that I'm really interested in telling. Um, and I applied for some grants, which I didn't get, um, but I just, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, I had to do this, these stories. And then after September 11th hit, uh, I was really even more uh, vested in trying to, to tell these stories. And so I had a chance to go to Japan on a food story for Sever magazine and ended up taking an extra week and going to Hiroshima. So I, I would say Hiroshima was the pivotal story because I, I was proactive about it. I chose to go there rather than yeah. chance driving me to a place. So it was really after Hiroshima that I sort of decided in my mind and heart to turn this into a project. And again, it just kind of built and built and built. And then about 20 years into the project, I realized that what this really was about was my own family's Holocaust history. There's a sort of crossover between that, I think, and the Holocaust uh, work that you've you've done with the the uh, those that the that survived the Holocaust. I mean, it was really when I was commissioned by the Museum of Tolerance yeah. to do the portrait series of Holocaust survivors. I started sharing my own family story for the first time, mm. and in a way, I inhabited the story and the meaning and the emotions and the loss and the trauma because my parents were both gone by that point. And they had never talked about anything or anybody. It was like they came to America and then it was just, there was no past. There were no anecdotes. There was nothing. So it was really through my exchanges with these survivors and a couple of them became friends. And that was the critical sort of turning point for me. And that those features sort of fed into each other in, in some respects, didn't they? Yeah, but I would say for me working on this, this was never a, a, this project was never a concept. I mean, it was just, it was something that, I don't know how to describe it, Neil. It was like, I know this will sound strange, but I was so almost possessed by it. And sometimes I almost felt like I had a, a hand on my right shoulder, just like steering me along the path. I was so invested in it. I just had to do it. And I didn't understand why. And I didn't know how to finish it for years. I didn't know what it would become, and then, you know, but I just kept going. Let's talk about that word investment, because it seemed to me that you became pretty invested in the in the particular people within your, your study. Did you feel that? Well, I tell people, you know, I travel with an open mind and an open heart. Yeah. I would say I came to them just as a human being and as somebody I wanted to hear and tell their story. Mm. There was a real communion with a lot of these women on a very deep mm. level. And often I would share the story of my own grandparents and great grandmother and great uncle getting killed in a massacre, you know? So I would share the story of my family's war history as a means of, you know, saying, this is who I am. I just, I just want to know what your story is. Do you think that helped? Um, definitely. And I think as a woman, but I think, again, there was no calculation in my telling this. The, the motivation was just to share these stories. And often I would bring photographs of other women from other places in the world. Like I showed when I was trying to meet mothers who'd lost sons in Iraq, in the Iraq war, so mothers in Ohio, I had to make a whole presentation at a bereavement session. And so I had brought photographs of the Afghan women, of the women from Northern Ireland, from Kosovo. And it was fascinating 
watching them looking at these photographs and realizing, okay, we've all had the same experience. Yeah. You know, again, I was just, I felt like I was just this conduit to to document. As I, as I look through the, the collection of these pictures in particular, uh, of course, the, you know, the eyes I connect with telling their own individual stories. Um, I mean, there's sadness and there's terror in there, regret, fear, all those words. But it was a I've got to say, Marissa, it was a it was an object that I must have lingered at for for the longest. It was the in case of death letter that soldiers are instructed to write. Did did you ask to see that, or or did the mother offer that up? Um, I knew you were going to say that. Um, so I had heard about these letters, and I had never seen one. And then when I was interviewing Jody Davids um, in Ohio, her son, so I was interviewing her. I met her in November and her son had died in August, just a few months before. And she brought up the letter that it had been returned in his, uh, like a duffel bag with his belongings. Yeah. And I asked her if I could see the letter. And it was interesting because I, I put on my photographer's hat then, you know, trying to keep my own emotions at bay enough, you know. And then I thought, how do I photograph this? And, you know, how creative should it be or straightforward? And then I just thought, I just have to photograph it as a document. And so I just put it on the chair next to me in the sun. Mm. I just let it open as it was. And you can read part of it, but you can't read all of it. No, you can't, no is the closing paragraph, you know, that bit, which I think is perhaps the most personal part to his parents that's obscured. Yeah, but in a way, you don't really even need it. You, you know, you don't need, you don't need the, the information to the nth degree mm. because it's about, it's about the meaning of it and the feeling behind it and the shock of it. I mean, I still find it shocking when I read it, you know, because you think, wow, are they... Are they really that devoted or are they brainwashed? You know, I mean, it's kind of a complicated question, you know, to sort of turn your life over in such a way, particularly for those wars which are controversial. I mean, one, Sarah Duval, the, the mother who's holding, hugging the portrait of her son, yeah. her ex-husband and his second wife were so angry. They were anti the war and they just could not get over their grief and anger. And they were just in such turmoil. Whereas Sarah had was much more religious and she had basically accepted and supported the war. Yeah. So here are two parents who were co dealing with their son's death completely differently. As a photojournalist, how do you react to those moments when, when you've got these two sort of totally different opinions? Um, when I'm working, I have no opinion. Um, it's not my place to judge them or insert myself. I'm very adamant about it. I tried very hard to be democratic, I guess, with the whole project and, and thought hard about every subject I photographed and I try to, you know, to tell two sides of a story if possible. So I, I had photographed Jewish women who'd survived the Holocaust, but I realized I really need to tell a, a different side of the story. And I had read a book called a woman in Berlin by anonymous. And it basically was a, a journal by a German woman, woman. I think she was a journalist actually. And she had um, kept a diary during the siege of Berlin and she was, she was raped. She was basically being held almost hostage by a Russian lieutenant. Um, you know, had to sleep with them, had to do everything, feed, you know, get food. And it was such an extraordinary book. I mean, it wasn't tawdry, but it was very matter of fact. And I read it and it gave me such a different perspective. And I thought, okay, I have to go to Berlin and photograph German women who survived the siege of Berlin. Mm. PTSD is something that I, I hear mentioned when photographers talk about those they photograph. But what about you as a Photographer, what's been the mental fallout for you with what you've seen in Bosnia, the killing fields, doing these projects? What's, what's it left you with? Um, I probably have trauma-acquired PTSD, although I didn't realise it until maybe the last seven, eight years. 
But yeah, I, I probably do. Um, so it kind of exploded actually uh, after uh, I had I tried to move to Vancouver in 2012 and then it all fell apart and blew up and I got back to LA and then started having unbelievable anxiety attacks and to the point where I was almost incapacitated. I haven't actually never told anybody this. And um, it's a pretty frightening time. And um started working with a therapist um, on this and then started realizing what actually this was. Um, and so, so I know what the triggers are, you know, and I've talked a lot about it now with different people because I did a project um, on photographs by Vietnam veterans who, when yeah. they took photographs during the Vietnam war. Mm-hmm. And I became friends with a number of these veterans and I, how I got to them was my exhibition on women in war went to the high ground Vietnam veterans Memorial park in Wisconsin. And it was interesting because two of the veterans later told me that when they met me, they said, Oh yeah, she's got PTSD. So they saw it in me, but I, I did had no, I was clueless. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, when you're working as a photojournalist, you just, you just go, mm-hmm. you know, I was working with a lot of, male photojournalists and you don't have time to think about your own mental health. I mean, I saw a lot of horrible stuff. Mm. I mean, I had to photograph a car crash three weeks after my mother died and I begged my photo editor not to send me out Mm. and he didn't care. He just sent me out. And it was, it was such a horrific scene with a dead body and everything. Um, They didn't run the picture because it was too horrible for the paper, but you know, did I need to see that? No, but you know, I couldn't, I had to do my work, so I'm okay for the most part. Well, yeah. I, do, I do want to come back to the the, the one person crying um, in a moment, but you did mention mum, and I, uh, you found this extraordinary gift in in a drawer, I think, left by your mum before she passed away. Some news clippings that uh, you didn't know she'd been collecting, I think. Yeah. So my mom, she was funny because she. She scoured the paper, apparently, every day, the L.A. Times, and she would always complain when I did, like, a hard news story. She just wanted me to do Hollywood and society parties. Um, and I, you know, I, I knew she was proud of me, but, you know, I, you know, you're young and you're just you're zooming at, you know, 100 miles an hour. And um, and then after she died, I had to take care of everything, her condo and her possessions and there was a drawer in her, she had a little filing cabinet and there was a drawer and the whole top drawer was filled with every single newspaper clipping that I had done over the, um, I guess it was, she died. So it was probably like seven years worth of of newspaper clippings. So, oh, it made me feel so good, you know, that, okay, she was really proud of me. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, one person crying, women in war, uh, we we said 35 years. Um, When did you know that the project was closed. So I thought it was finished a couple times. When I was in Bosnia in 2009, I went to Bosnia twice in 2009 to uh, follow the path of the Srebrenica massacre. And also it was just such a big story and psychologically and emotionally so wrenching and taxing. I couldn't sort of do it all at once. Mm. And I was working, my fixer, so-called fixer, was actually wonderful man, Zoran Chodyakovich, who had been a journalist during the war. And anyway, I hired him for two, three weeks to drive into Bosnia. And so he was my everything person, um, translator. He knew where everything was and knew where the mass graves were. Um, And of course, you're in a car with somebody for weeks, you tell stories. And he had heard about the massacre that my grandparents were killed in, my grandparents and great great grandmother in Novi Sad, Yugoslavia. It was a three day massacre in January of 1942. Mm. And Zoran said, We finished up a couple days early on the second trip, and, he, and we went back to Belgrade. And he said, Do you want to go to Novi Sad? Because we had been there as a family in 84. It's the first time my dad went back. And we found my grandparents' home, which is actually where they were killed on the doorstep. And the home became a children's daycare center after World War II. 
And so Zoran said, do you want to go to Nebusad? So I said, yes. And he did a lot of research and he found that there was a monument dedicated to the massacre. So we found my grandparents' home again. And then we went to this monument and I had seen a photograph of this very strange sculpture, almost like a Giacometti like which is almost like stick figures. It's quite haunting. Mm. And I bought some roses and I was putting the roses down and I was just, you know, it was very intense. And then Zoran called to me and there was a, a, a sort of bank of names and my grandparents' names are on that monument, on the memorial. And um, I was hysterical and it was in Cyrillic, so I couldn't have read it, you know, but Zoran found them. And I was, I was hysterical, actually. I mean, I was just weeping. Poor guy. He didn't know what to do with me. And in that moment, I thought, this is what it's all been about. It's, this is, this is, and now the project's done. So I was 2009. <laughs> and then in 2011, uh, the director of the Museum of Tolerance came to me and she said, I'd like to do the, a Women in War exhibition in 2012 uh, before the big Anne Frank show comes in for 10 years. So I hired a curator and we started working and the show went up, opened in LA, then it went to Berlin uh, later that year. And then the Centre de la Mémoire de Orador, so Orador of France, where there'd been a terrible massacre. They have a memory center museum and they took the show for 12, for 10 months. Wow. And so I thought, well, I really should go to Orador to photograph so that the images can be in the exhibition to make it relevant to their location. So, so now I think you're seeing the project actually wasn't done. So there's <laughs> Vietnam and then now there's Orador um, and then in 2015, I had the opportunity to meet and photograph Anne Frank's cousin. So I photographed her. Um, 2018, I had a chance again with International Medical Corps to uh, photograph in, in Jordan, Syrian and Iraqi refugee women. So again, I'm still praying that the project is finished, but I hadn't really come to an end point. Um, so I did Jordan. Um, and then in 2019, I just thought, you know, I have to put a period at the end of the sentence because otherwise it's going to kill me, yeah. you know, psychologically, emotionally, financially. I just need an end point. And I'm one of those photographers that finishes projects. Um, so I decided I wanted to go to my great grandmother's hometown, which is now in Romania, Satumari, Romania, because my great grandmother was an amazing woman and um, very courageous in her own way. And so I took one of my young cousins from Budapest and we went to Satumare. And in my mind and heart, I designated that to be the final day of the project. And we went to the synagogue, which she wouldn't have gone to because it's, it was, it's built in the early 20th century. And, um, and uh, ended up being invited to a little picnic uh, by one of the elders in the synagogue that, you know, the congregation was there. And I'm like laughing, crying. We're drinking palinka and Coca-Cola and eating schnitzel and grapes. And, and, I, and it was so hot. It's like 35 Fahrenheit. I mean, it was just sweltering. But in my mind and heart, for me, that was the end point. So the opening picture is yeah. my grandmother's home. And then my the closing photograph is, that, you know, for my great grandmother. Was it as poetic then as, as, as pressing that shutter button and saying, done? Yeah, I mean, it was massive. Yeah. It was massive. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I can honestly say peacefully it's finished. <laughs> well, well, to talking of peace, this study <laughs> of the Atlantic Ocean for four years, seven transatlantic crossings, shot solely on colour transparency, I think, wasn't it? The world apart from your news work and, of course, from the, the, the project that had taken you 35 years. It's, it's called The Crossing, this particular one. And like the previous two projects we've talked about, the survivors of the Holocaust and women at war, where the, the two projects were at times sort of woven together, Th this one, your time just staring out at the ocean, it feels to me, Marissa, like, like it too connects with these two stories, survivors of the Holocaust in particular. But, but uh, when one big chapter closed, another one starts to open, doesn't it? Well, I was like, now what? you know, sort of this restless question mark. And 
just all of a sudden the, the words, the crossing kind of came to my mind. This happens to me where I'll just get like something inhabits my brain. And I kept thinking about it. And I kept thinking about my parents who actually met and fell in love on the original Queen Mary on a transatlantic crossing from Le Havre to New York yeah. in October of 1938. So I'm sure you know your World War II history. Yeah. Um, they were sensing, they were Hungarian, and they were sensing that dark things were coming, mm. um, and they had the courage and the means to uh, leave. And so they fell in love on the ship. They got lost from each other at Ellis Island, and they literally, by chance, bumped into each other in Times Square five months later. Oh, my word. So, <laughs> again, <laughs> I know, it's very romantic. Maybe that's why I keep, you know, taking cross things. I keep hoping I'll finally find the love of my life or something. Um, um, but I think it was really the final piece of the story, which is really personal, that it was really about my parents. And so um, all of this was just swirling inside of me. And then it was a quiet Sunday morning in January. And I was reading the New Sunday New York Times and I was reading the travel section. And there was an ad for Cunard, 175th anniversary special transatlantic crossings. And this thing jumped out at me like, you know, I mean, it was just like, ta-da. So I was like, oh, my God. And so I called Cunard and I said, I don't know anything about transatlantic crossing. They said, oh, well, um, yeah, you know, I said, they said our first crossing leaves on May 10th. And I was like, OK, that's my birthday. I think this is a sign from the universe that I need to do this. And I literally booked the crossing straight away and um, didn't know how I would respond to it photographically. I shows i did tests on different color transparency film and decided on one of them bought 100 rolls of film had no idea how i would respond i booked a cabin that was on the lowest level with an outside little balcony so i could be as that had still open air um so i could be as close to the water line as possible and that was it i had no idea if i would respond photographically and, it's, it's and, quite meditative some of it isn't it um oh yeah so yeah. the first crossing was really emotional i mean yeah. i just thought of my parents and what it, i mean it was really what it feels like to cross an ocean but what it means to cross an ocean um so in, in in a way it started off being for my parents but i think ultimately the more i took of them i realized it was my own catharsis and it was kind of healing me in the process from all of this other work mm. Um, I love it. I mean, I love being on just in that suspended sea time, if you will. And um, well, you do love it. I mean, you did it seven times. <laughs> yeah. No, and I can't wait to get back on the ship. So, I mean, it's not for me. It's not like a cruise, you know, where you go. And I was, I was social, but moderately antisocial. I kind of yeah. did my own thing, but I was social as well. But I was. I was just always looking at the ocean and the light and the sea state. And yeah, I just, I don't know. It was like it inhabited me. Yeah, because it's important to point out that this isn't a project where you're photographing those on board. Your camera is yeah. always pointed out. I mean, there are, yeah. there are there was some time, I mean, westbound May 2019, it gets pretty rough out there, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure the balcony wasn't open that day, surely. No, my little balcony, I could barely open the window, no. yeah, door. <laughs> but, yeah, and I'm not good. Um, I get a little green around the gills. I mean, I never got seasick, but no. I got a little woozy, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, now you're you're in England. Um, you're, you're, I mean, the last year, of course, has been pictures of, uh, was well, Cantata was the project, wasn't it? Uh, a, a, a musical reference to, to the project. You escaped to the. You, you ended up in London. You escaped to the countryside though when COVID hit. It's almost like wartime evacuation. Um, may, maybe maybe another story feeding into to this history of yours. <laughs> yes, I was. I had been in LA finishing a Holocaust project, a portrait portrait series of Holocaust survivors for the Museum of Tolerance. Got back here March twelfth last year, and then, as we know, the world shut down. Mm. Um, and I didn't have a place to stay. I'd been coming and going from a little hotel and a good friend of mine in Surrey 
she didn't want to be alone. She knew I was on my own and she said, come to me. And I said, great, thank you. Oh my God, I owe you a debt of gratitude for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so um, during my time with her, you know, it was spring into summer and I always travel with a little camera, black and white, a little contacts camera loaded with black and white film. It's sort of my sketchbook. And I would just photograph randomly, you know, almost what I was seeing and feeling, but I think the feelings come through, you know, as metaphor for what I was seeing. I don't know. It was just, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's an extension of who I am, my hand, my breath. Um, and so while I was staying with her, I was also drawing and doing collage, which I hadn't done in years. And then occasionally I'd pull out the camera, but by the time I got to back to London in July, I had shot 20 rolls of film and I had absolutely no recall of what I'd photographed, zero, none. And when I got the, the rolls of film back from the lab here, I was like shocked. And it almost brought back all of the anxiety from being in the lockdown and the pandemic and the whole thing. Mm. And um, I realized it was a really interesting series. Mm. It did, well, you can so see it I, on your website. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so I started started sequencing it by date um and then i kept going with it through all the way through uh december so um i ended up still staying here um ended up finding a little flat to so i could stay in london for the second lockdown and now the third lockdown <laughs> <And> so <laughs> hello and <laughs> and, and just kept photographing for it and then literally with the winter solstice i thought i'm done yeah. I, I, I there's nothing really more to say i must say um, i do love that expression by the way that you've used that you think of your camera as your sketchbook what a lovely what a lovely thought yeah well my that, the contacts has been that um you know it's in it's so easy to bring out um it's a beautiful little beast it's titanium um yeah. Yeah. and you know, it's, and I know exactly what it's going to give me. And it's just, it's so easy to use. I don't have to think about it. Mm. And yet the pictures are wonderful. Mm. Um, and it's just there, you know, I don't have, I, I, it's, it's, it, it takes all the seriousness out of it in a sense. It's like, it's just like breathing for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've been shooting, I mean, this is my fourth, incarnation of it because i've dropped one rained on with another one so but i i have my original one uh i had until a big raindrop came into the lens um <laughs> but that i bought it in 1995 so literally it's a long time um but yeah they it's just it's so friendly yeah. for me and um yeah where does your contacts take you next uh, my contact, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really taken any pictures since December because I'm, I'm sort of stuck in lockdown in the same place and I've, I've sort of run out of inspiration. I, I just can't, I don't, I, I'm not seeing anymore anything different yeah. than I've already taken. Yeah. So maybe when spring comes, I'll, I'll see it again. Um, but I don't need to photograph every day. I mean, I'm also writing. I wrote poetry for the Cantata series. There's five point po poems that accompany it. Um, and I have no idea what the next, I'm going to actually try to do a Cantata book and we'll probably be uh, amping up for a GoFundMe campaign in the next couple of months. But after that, I have no idea. I uh, uh, My next project will be a curating project, which is a retrospective exhibition about Frank Hurley, the Australian photographer mm. who was aboard the Endurance Expedition. So that's kind of the big next thing, probably in the next couple of years. Um, and personal projects, I have no idea. But that's the beauty though, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's the fun of it. Yeah. Um, although I have to say, in all honesty, I'm a bit relieved not to have all the the war themed work possessing me anymore bearing down on me it's i feel like I, I have my life for myself finally for the first time the pain is gone the hole in my heart is gone i'm pretty peaceful yeah my thanks to marissa roth and you'll find links to marissa's work and of course her pictures on the show notes page today 
Friday is the photo walk edition. Your mails, your messages about anything to do with you and your photography or even feedback about this show. Let's hear your stories, what you've done with your sketch pad, to borrow Marissa's wonderful words. Send your mails to studio at photographydaily.show. That's studio at photographydaily.show. Or, of course, you can mail in through the contact page. Send a, a DM through the Facebook group that we now have. Have you joined? And it goes without saying that you can also get in touch if you're a, a patron through the messaging there. Studio Ninja have uh, an offer for you right now. They are an end-to-end -end client management software designed for professional photographers. It takes, and you'll have heard me say this, and it's true, less than 30 minutes to set up, and then you've got everything in one place. Your diary, your workflow, your address book, even e-sign contracts, and you get 50% off your first year of use by entering the code PHOTODAILY50 if you go to studioninja.co. Links on the show page too. Music in the show was from artlist.io, and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you, and talking with you next time. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.